We're grateful for our song leaders that lead us in these great old songs that help us draw near to God and think on spiritual matters to prepare our minds, as the scripture reading and prayers do, to study God's holy word. As Mitch said, if we would study our Bibles more and pray more and be more spiritual, the cause of Christ here and elsewhere would grow. We're grateful that we work with such a congenial group of people and the core members here really do put the kingdom first and even on a day like this when our crowd is down because of the weather and illness and traveling and this time of the year that some people use as an excuse really uh, to see the steadfastness of so many and the contribution still doing well on even a day like this when the crowd is down it's very very encouraging my wife and i often talk about this in our hour drive both here and back home uh, that we make uh, several times a week uh, really and truly this is a congenial group of people and more than that all interested in spreading the gospel you know when you can have a meeting to discuss the business of the lord's work and everyone wants to spread the gospel everyone's evangelistic everyone wants to contribute and uh, see the work grow in the spiritual dimension that's very very heartwarming and uplifting and we're most grateful for that turn to second corinthians 10 verse 1 we'll have just a brief review of the two chapters 8 and 9 that we studied in bible class in the auditorium today since many of you were elsewhere in other classes i want to just briefly review the two chapters that deal with giving he speaks mainly of what god gave god uh, gave an unspeakable, inexpressible, incomparable gift, Christ. So the top of the list of giving is what God gave. And then 2 Corinthians 8 9, what Christ was willing to give himself. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24. And then what the Macedonians gave, though in poverty themselves, they begged to be enabled to give to the poor saints of Judea. And then he speaks to the Corinthians of what they purposed a year before to do, and he said, now perform the doing of it. And he lifted giving to its highest possible pedestal, show the proof of your love, 824. But the very heart of it all in a practical application to us, as to the Corinthians 2,000 years ago, he said, when you give generously, you receive generously, not so you can have more but so you can get more so you can give more the televangelists who talk about seed money and they really mean keep it coming my direction uh, one of those fellows who went to prison later uh, even had uh, uh, gold uh, handles on the doghouse and had uh, an air-conditioned doghouse and all the appointments in his master bath uh, had gold on them and so forth and his point was, uh, God will really bless you and make you rich if you'll just send money in here. And then they gave the address about 19 times in big letters, you know. This idea of the gospel of prosperity. The Bible nowhere teaches if you'll give generously to the cause of Christ, you'll be rich. It says you'll get more so you can have more, so you can give more. Not so you can hold on to it for yourself. The perpetual nature of sowing and reaping is what he's talking about. And there were poor saints in Judea, which proves that uh, every Christian isn't supposed to be rich. In fact, the Lord taught if you'd seek first the kingdom, you would receive what? Luxuries, necessities, food, clothing, and shelter. Matthew 6, 33. In other words, you would have enough, but you'd be blessed beyond that to help others and to get the gospel of the whole world. And until we learn that lesson and shut those fellows off, and get back to the Bible and learn what the book really teaches us. We're not on earth to be wealthy. We're on earth to be faithful. And we're on earth to put the kingdom of God first so he can bless us in reciprocal action so we can help others. And I think that's a lesson that Second Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and particularly chapter 9, verses 6 through 15, tell us. And he closes those chapters with thanks be unto God for his inexpressible, incomparable gift, Christ. We'll never give up to the uh, proportion that God does. But we can re respond by being generous. Now in chapter 10, verse 1, he really begins 10, 11, 12, and 13 that deal with the interpersonal relationship between him and the Corinthians. And how much better that relationship would be if 
they would get rid of the false teachers who undermined the work of Paul, the apostle of Christ, who was made an apostle not by men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Last of all, he was seen of me, he said in 1 Corinthians 15. And the gospel I preached was certified by heaven, not by men. And those who claimed to be somewhat didn't add anything to me. All of that from Galatians chapters 1 and 2, but it blends with this. And he's beginning to talk about how much he loved the Corinthians and how they once loved him as one who had brought the gospel to them and had begotten them through the gospel. They wouldn't be Christians without his coming to Corinth in the first place by himself to preach the gospel in that ungodly city. And yet they were allowing people to come in and undermine his apostleship and his work and even their faith and the progress of the congregation. And this is the beginning of uh, tearing down that error and replacing it with a bond of love. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. In other words, I'm like Christ. He was both uh, meek and gentle. And they were saying, yeah, when he's uh, with you, he's very meek and gentle. But when he gets away from me, he writes these real uh, stern letters. He doesn't have the courage to be that way in your midst. He said, how about Christ? We're to emulate him. Follow me as I follow Christ, he said to them in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. But I believe the phrase, meekness and gentleness of Christ, uh, we owe something, some time to that discussion. Meekness of Christ. The passage John read from Philippians 2 is the epitome of this. Have the mind of Christ in you, who being in the form of God, counted it not robbery, be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on him the form of a servant, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The most shameful, painful, as preachers have said through the years, ignominious death in the history of mankind. He was willing to leave heaven, come to earth, subjugate himself to the Father's will, which meant he had died at Calvary for those who crucified him. You can't be more meek than that. And the word meek is a sheepfold term. It means the sheep do not lead the shepherd, they follow the shepherd. They don't run before the Lord, they follow his steps, 1 Peter 2, 22. And Jesus said, I've come down from heaven, notice, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me, John 6, 38. He prayed, I've glorified thee upon the earth, I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do, John 17, 4. In the garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Matthew 26, 42. So Jesus was meek and lowly. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. Someone says, gentleness? How about the seven woes he pronounced upon Jerusalem? And the last one he said, your house had left you desolate, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? What's the gentle about that? The verse before he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest a prophet and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often have I gathered thy children together as a hen gathered their chicks under her wings, but you would not. He could be stern and firm when he had to be, but he basically was gentle and sweet-spirited and kind. To get their attention, well, Paul used the analogy in one of his epistles of a gentle mother who will slap hard on a child's back lest they choke to death. Whereas I've seen some of the gentlest women Clear out a character to save a child's life. I've been present on such an occasion like that, and it's startling. But there's something more than gentleness involved, and that's to save a life that's dear to you. Still a gentle person taking extreme measures to help save somebody, and that's the way Jesus was. He was basically meek and gentle. Did you know the tenderest thing he ever said? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly and heart and you'll find rest your soul. Do you know what that follows? Woe unto you, Bethsaida. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee. If the mighty works have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they've been done in you, Tyre and Sidon and so forth, they'd repent in sackcloth a long time ago. Some of the bluntest things he ever said. It'll not be tolerable for you in the day of judgment. Then he says, come unto me, all you that labor every lady. You know what precedes? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. You know what precedes that? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know what precedes that? That's Revelation 3, 19 and 20. Five denunciations of five out of the seven congregations to whom the book of Revelation was addressed. To the last one, Laodicea, he said, you make me sick. 
I'll spew you out of my mouth. And then he follows. I stand at the door and knock. Please open and let me in. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. And we need that blend. Preachers need that blend. Preachers who think they're sound preachers because all they do is just skin the bark off people. They never say a kind thing. They never encourage anybody. They don't build up anything. They tear down. That's not a gospel preacher. We're to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15. When we have to rebuke sin, do it without partiality. 1 Timothy 5. Don't show respect to persons when you do. But basically, a gospel preacher, if the word gospel means good news, glad tidings, that's what he ought to be the main ambassador of. A man is sound who teaches the whole counsel of God. A man is sound who's like Christ. Invite all sinners to be saved and rebuke every sinner for his iniquity so he can come out of it so he can be saved. The meekness and gentleness of Christ forms a balance that we need to think about. And we need that in the body of Christ. Some people are so wishy-washy and they stand for nothing and the devil can just say, blow them clear off the map of the world. That's not being a Christian. But a fellow who's just always... And again, I know of a periodical that's been around for about a half a century now that hadn't had a positive issue in all of its existence. Lambasting somebody somewhere every time. Why, if people read that who are not members of the church and realize he's talking only about members of the church and preachers and elders and congregations, they'd say... I don't want to be a part of that bunch of folk. They're out headhunting all the time. So we need to realize Christ, though bold and courageous and straightforward and was crucified because of it, was also basically, fundamentally, meek and gentle. And we need to understand the kindness that goes with being a Christian and the encouragement. Uh, parents who are always negative toward their children and even in public uh, belittling them, uh, I just can't think of anything worse in all the world. I mentioned once before in Adelaide, Australia, I was walking from my house down to the little shopping center, but it didn't mean what you think shopping center. It meant they were, there was a delicatessen, and there was the vegetable stand, and there was the fruit stand. That was their three-fold uh, shopping center. But for about three blocks, I followed a woman who every step of the way hit or kicked or pushed the child walking in front of her. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Brutal. Well, that child didn't have hope in the world of growing up well balanced. And I wouldn't be surprised when that child got big enough that's uh, got a board and two before and followed the mother. But uh, the meekness and gentleness of Christ, we need to learn something from that. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now we come to the next three verses, some of the most important verses in the epistles of Paul in all the New Testament. He wrote half the New Testament. In fact, this is a basic fundamental understanding of the nature of Christianity. I precede it with what Jesus said to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight. He's talking about in carnal warfare. We would promulgate we would make progress in the kingdom we're members of by fighting in carnal combat like the world does and the nations of the world do. He said, but though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the putting down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You understand what he's saying there? The nature of the Christian's warfare is not carnal. It's not combative with uh, the weapons of war, carnal warfare. It's a spiritual battle. And in Ephesians 6, he says we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, with the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. That's the panoply the armament of the Christian soldier. And so God's kingdom is not promulgated like the Catholic Church did in the Crusades and Inquisitions. And here recently the Muslims have been saying, well, how about Christianity, meaning Catholicism, that proceeded through the Muslim world killing people in the name of Christianity? They had a pretty good parallel and a great question to be asked there. 
Catholicism renounced every claim to being the New Testament church in the Crusades and the Inquisitions. But we have some brethren who'd like for us just to mow people down with physical combative weaponry if they don't agree with us. We need to understand that Christianity is not pushed forward in this world by being worldly in its nature. The gospel is God's power, God's dynamite to save. Romans 1.16 Voice unto me if I preach not the gospel, Paul said. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. So Christianity is not pushed forward in the midst of a wicked, heathen, pagan world by carnal combat. We need to understand that. The only way we can ever proceed under the Prince of Peace is with non-carnal embattlement. A lot of people never understand that. Members of the church are so super patriotic like Jonah was. They're worthless to the kingdom of God. They want to force people, twist their arm, almost put a chokehold on them, throw them in the tank and call that baptism. That won't work. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty toward God. They're casting down the strongholds. And we can do more with the sword of the Spirit than all the armies and navies and air force and marines of the United States government ever did when Japan signed the peace treaty. Oh, they did sign that on board that ship. MacArthur was in charge. I understand all that. But do you think they quit hating the United States of America when Hirohito signed that document? Well, they hated us more. They wanted to bring us into subjection and turned around. Now they're just burning with passion to... Turn things around. They haven't changed their mind toward the United States of America. They've just been subdued by them in carnal warfare. But you know what we can do with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? We can bring every thought into captivity unto Christ. We can have people surrender their hearts, their minds, their lives. There's never been a more powerful army in the history of the world than one led by Christ as the chief commander. He's the captain of our salvation made perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2.10, Hebrews 5.89. He could have called 10,000 angels, legions of angels, but he didn't do it. He could have passed through the crowds untouched, unscathed, like he had before in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he acquiesces, he surrenders. He had the mind of the Heavenly Father. He left heaven to do the Father's will, and that meant even unto death, the death of the cross. He didn't combat carnal warfare with carnal warfare. He surrendered to the Father's will, which means you will die for the sins of the world, even those who are killing you. There's never been a conquest like that. You surrender to the Lord, you win. But you don't surrender because he beat you to death with a club or with bayonets or swords. You surrender your mind, your heart, your very being. That's what Christianity is all about. And Paul is simply saying in context, we didn't use carnal warfare. We didn't use carnal weaponry to... We just preach the gospel to you. And you gladly, individually, surrendered. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believing, were baptized. Wasn't a carnal combat issue there at all. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Acts 9, 6. We need to understand that Christianity is not pushed forward by carnal attitudes or embattlements but by bringing the Prince of Peace into chaotic, frenetic, frenzied lives. There's never been another army like it, another battle like it. And when victory is won there, it's genuine, everlasting victory, as long as the person surrendering remains faithful and loyal. There's never been anything like it. That's why I get real aggravated, and I better not get too strong on this tonight or we won't get off this and finish this chapter. It aggravates me when I have some brethren who think they've got something better and more powerful than the gospel of Christ to preach. Why the very idea of surrendering to sectarianism and presenting current events and sweet little notions and uh, having all kinds of carnal issues like applause and entertainment and jest and silliness and giddiness to push the gospel forward when we've already got the most powerful thing in the world. Why do we need to educate folk in schools and things like that that they can do something better than just preach the simple word of God? 
That's God's message. That's his dynamite. That's the energy with which we push Christianity out into the world. And I wonder about a man who'd call himself a gospel preacher who is so weak that he surrenders to sectarian appeal to make people feel good instead of make them feel ashamed of their sin and say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Avoid the pulpit that makes you feel bad. The editorial that circled the Brotherhood about 20 years ago, and incidentally the man who wrote it isn't preaching anymore because he thought that he had a new way of reaching a lot of people. So he introduced a TV program. Supposed to be a gospel preacher, supported supposedly by Christians, individual Christians, and by congregations of the Lord's people. And one of the first things he did at the introduction of the end, he had about 20 young men and women dancing across the stage like a sectarian program with spotlights on that. See, that didn't work. Might work in denominationalism. Might work on Broadway or in Hollywood. No wonder that guy isn't preaching anymore. He was a well-known household name back then. I knew him personally. And the congregation he was preaching for is now a community church in a West Texas town and a congregation that once had 2,000 members and had at least 1,500 people there every time. Now it's just an interdenominational social club. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty toward God, the casting down of strongholds, bring every thought into captivity under Christ. Now that's real surrender. Bring every thought into captivity under Christ. Verse 6. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled, do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. Now I'm going to present a point here for you to think about. You may disagree with it. I'm saying because I believe it's true. I believe that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when some said, we're of Paul, we're of Apollos, we're Cephas, who's Peter. That's what Christ called him in John 1, 42. Cephas, which means the stone when he first met him. And some of Christ. I believe because of the context, even those who claim to be of Christ were sectarian too. And this verse is one reason I believe that. People can be sectarian even though they use the right terminology. I've had people say to me, I'm a church of Christ couldn't be by yourself I'm a church of Christ fell in Wisconsin I'm a church of Christ Christian you can't be more sectarian than that and incidentally I am not a church of Christ preacher I'm a gospel preacher I know I'm not a church of Christ preacher because I preach a lot of things many members of the church don't like to hear I'm God's preacher a gospel preacher and I believe even in that setting even those who said I am of Christ and because of this verse verse 7 right here they were sectarian too. And Paul is simply saying, if you're going to follow that approach, then I certainly could say I am Christ's. He gave up leadership in Judaism to be a Christian, a Christian. Someone said, well, what would you say if someone asked you what you were religiously? I said, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the church you read about in the Bible. 1 Peter 4.16 tells me to glorify God and tells you too in the name Christian. Not some hyphenated kind of Christian. And to say I'm a church of Christ Christian is redundant if nothing else. But it's a shallow use of words. So when someone asks you what are you religiously? I've had people say well uh, when they find out I'm a preacher. Well what uh, denomination do you preach for? And I said none. And they look at me sort of stunned. I said I'm a gospel preacher. And I'm a member of the church I read about in the Bible. And personally I'm a Christian. And so we need to be careful the way we use words and not use something that may on its own not be unscriptural, but be sectarian in its usage. Again, I remind you of something I said over a year ago now. Iris and I took a lady after Sunday night services up in uh, Wisconsin many, many, many years ago. She was a wonderful Christian lady from Paducah, Kentucky that had moved up there to live with her sister. And uh, she's one of the finest Christians we've ever known. We took her to the hospital there in Appleton, Wisconsin, to enter her as a patient. 
as on Sunday night. We were sitting out in the lobby. We heard every word, though, the woman up there taking notes and uh, information and said, and what are you religiously? She said, I'm a Christian. She said, no, 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 no. I mean, are you Catholic? No. Then you're Protestant? No. Well, you don't look Jewish. What are you? I'm a Christian. A member of, your church, a member of the church read about in the Bible. I said, I never heard of that. And she said, you need to read your Bible. And she said it kindly. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And she hadn't been coached to say that. I was really interested in seeing how she'd handle that interview. One of the finest women I ever knew. So we need to really belong to Christ and not claim that in a denominational way. I've heard people say, uh, uh, use it like this. Uh, use the phrase, the church of Christ, in a denominational way. And even include us in denominations. And I do believe I have some brethren who believe the church of Christ is the best denomination of them all. It's not a denomination at all. And non-denominational could mean, with people listening, not a certain denomination. But undenominational is a much better phrase in trying to explain to people who have no headquarters on earth, no creed book written by men, no seminary established by the church to ordain preachers. We've got to make these things clear. And then there are those who think that they are ACU Christians or Harding Christians or Fried Hardman Christians and that's even making it worse. We're mixing and mingling human things with divine things. Christ did not die for any college anywhere. There was a large congregation in the Arlington area, and they had problems because the graduates from Harding and the graduates from Abilene kind of fought one another. They, they were jealous of one another. That's the dumbest thing that's ever been. So we don't ever want to use the phrase Christ in a denominational way. Verse 8, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, you remember what uh, Paul told Philemon? As an apostle of Christ, I could command you on how to treat Onesimus. But I believe you'll do much more than I ask on your own. That's good Bible psychology. Though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as I would to terrify you by letters. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. I was a very young preacher. We were living up in Wisconsin, and I had gone south to uh, preach in some meetings, one in Missouri and one in Illinois. One night in Missouri, I was there on a Sunday night, and this country preacher was trying to quote this, and he said, and my speech is contemplatable. I thought, well, there's a new word we need to add to the dictionary. But uh, every time that I've read anything about what the Apostle Paul looked like, he was bald-headed, <laughs> kind of like this, <laughs> and had kind of a large nose and big ears. I mean, it's awful, I think. Of course, I guess if you could look like him, I'd make you preach like him, it'd be all right. But everything I've ever heard about him and read about him was that. And the point was, have you ever seen him in person? you ever hear him in person? Paul is making the point the power is the gospel. That's what's important. I have planted a Paulus watered, but God gives the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 6, and 7. But these uh, Judaizing teachers who despise Paul for leaving them and becoming a Christian who thought more of Judaism than Christianity, followed him around undermining his work. Now they're saying, oh, when he gets away from me, he's such a coward, he'll be real bold, but when he's present, he's a sissy. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we're absent, such shall we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It'd be like if I were to say, I don't believe there's another congregation on earth with this attendance that gives this much money and aren't we great? That'd be comparing us with us. As old country boy, you say usins with usins. Uh, Weans with usins. That's not the point. How do we compare with Christ? 
Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We're to follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, 22. So he said, what you're doing is comparing earthly things with earthly things, and that won't raise you to a spiritual level. We're going to have to be wiser than that because Christ is our example. He's the one who was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. Verse 13, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed us. Philippians 3.15 says there is a pattern that God's revealed, a rule that should guide our life and not humanity, which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Now notice how he wants to go beyond them, as he says in Romans 15, 20, even unto Spain, lest we build upon any other man's foundation. Every preacher, and I'll say it again and say it clear, every preacher raised in Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Tennessee and Alabama and the Bible Belt, ought to plan on spending some of his preaching career in difficult places. First of all, it would be good for him. But preachers who've only been in those places and never intend to leave and whose parents and in-laws don't want them to leave will never evangelize the world that way. Somebody's got to pick up and go. And having done that for about seven and a half or eight years of my preaching and meeting in rented halls in the northern United States and Australia, I'm thankful to God for the opportunity and for the experiences. But it, I feel sorry for guys who just circle around uh, where they grew up all their life and never even have a concept of world evangelism. Does the Great Commission apply to everybody but them? And I really feel bad about congregations that never reach out around the world to spread the gospel. And that's one of the real exciting things about this congregation. We may be comparatively small in number, but percentage-wise, we are doing much to spread the gospel, and we need to do more. We're not through yet. And have you noticed how the contribution has increased and continued to increase as we increase evangelistic thrust? We can't just build on other people's uh, foundation. We've got to go beyond that. And here's Paul late in his preaching career hoping to press onward to Spain, an uncharted part of the world in his day, lest he build upon another man's foundation. Not boasting of things without our measure, verse 15, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we may be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Do you read what he's saying there in verse 15? When your faith increases, your contribution will increase. You ever thought about that? What caused a man to, in this uh, commercialized, uh, selfish world, to want to reach in his pocket and his bank account and give to the cause of Christ, which you can't really see. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. His faith must have increased. He must trust in God to keep his promise, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, food, clothing, shelter, all these things be added to you. And the more we believe that, the more we won't worry about if I don't have but a dollar and a quarter left after the plate passes. We don't think like that. We think on the compounded interest that we have in souls, some of whom have yet to hear the gospel. We think of a fellow walking a lonely path on a dusty road in Africa or in a little village in India that hadn't heard the gospel yet. So when your faith increases, our work in your midst will increase, Paul said. A stamid, midget faith won't get the job done. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And every time I read that verse, I think of all my dad's kinfolks that resented him obeying the gospel and becoming a member of the church of the Lord and leaving denominationalism he had been raised in. Every one of them, when they'd get around me after I became a preacher, they'd even write to me sometimes and say, I know I'm saved. If I died right now, I know to go, I'd go to heaven. Not he that commendeth himself is approved before God, but whom the Lord commendeth. There's one thing I know for sure, and that is God will do what's right. 
when I go to bed at night, I don't go to bed with the calm assurance that if I died in my sleep, I'd go to heaven. I go to bed with this deep Bible concept. God will do what's right with me and with you too, whatever you may think about this. And what God chooses to do will be right. And in the meantime, I want to live for him in the here and now because that's the only way to live. I've had people say to me, well, if I didn't know I'd go to heaven and died right now, I'd just quit. That's not very strong faith in God. I know God will do what's right. And that gives me comfort when I go to bed at night and when I get up in the morning or when I walk down the middle of the street the next day. That if I serve God, He'll take care of me. He'll put me where I belong. And though I may commend myself, that doesn't mean God commends me. If a person can say, I know if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. Guess what? He's already become his own judge. Jesus might as well step down from the judgment seat. He said, the Father turned the judgment over to me, John 5, 22. This person said, oh, no, Lord, I'm going to tell you. I'm safe. If I died right now, I know him. Get off that. You're no judge of mine. I've judged myself. If I got news for most of my kin folks who never obeyed the truth, they may think they know. But God's the one who knows. And he's revealed his will for them and for me and for you in the book. I've even had some of them say that old song. I wouldn't trade the feeling in my heart for all the Bibles in the world. That's a terrible approach. Not he that commended himself as approved before God, but whom the Lord commanded. You know why that's true? We don't demand so much of ourselves usually. I'm doing the best I can. I wonder if any of us has ever yet done the best we can. When that moment came, we ought to pray to die right then. But the Bible says, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Well, if I'm doing the best I can, I can't obey that verse, and yet that verse directed to me. Some people don't think. They live on emotions that are very poorly constructed. What a great chapter that is. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. When your faith increases, our work in your midst will increase. And not he that commendeth himself is approved before God, but whom the Lord commendeth. And quit comparing yourself with others. That's unwise. Well, if that's all we learn today, that'd be worthwhile. Don't you see why I really believe 2 Corinthians is one of the most preachable books in the whole Bible? Seems like every verse just jumps out of the page to gain attention. You've listened well, and I hope it's done all of us some good. Now, the Lord willing, Wednesday night, 2 Corinthians 11. And next week, chapters 12 and 13, and review next Sunday, review of the whole book. And I believe then we'll be prepared to personally study on our own to get more out of it. If we can learn to be more analytical when we study, and to read and back off and think, and then run cross-references, that'll help us mightily in the years to come, if by God's grace they come, to be better Bible students. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Acts 18, 8. If you have heard and believed but haven't been baptized, and you understand your responsibilities, this would be a good time, maybe the only time, for you to obey the truth. Let us stand and sing.